I've been a woodsman my whole life. Growing up in the state of Alaska, I spent a great amount of time in the wilderness. Countless days tracking down massive bears, moose, and caribou. Weeks at a time, mushing sled dogs across frozen rivers. And being a guide on the most difficult hunts taught me survival skills that most of my colleagues will only dream of. Which is why I've made my living off of the land on a remote homestead in the Matsu Valley south of Denali National Park. Being considered one of the best hunter trackers in a land full of them is what brought me to the attention of the FBI when they needed a very dangerous animal found and killed. It was a cold winter day when I first met Special Agent Jones. I was just feeding my huskies their usual mix of hot water, salmon, and the best commercial dog food you can get. Trudging along towards my modest little log cabin to warm my cold body, I heard the whining of a snowmobile engine coming up the trail. It was unusual to hear a snowmobile on a Tuesday, with the weekenders gone home for the time being. So, patiently waiting for it to continue west toward town, it suddenly turned north, towards me. And ten minutes later, a smaller man wearing a fishing game winter jacket on a newer trail model pulled into my yard. The dogs, hearing a strange machine pull into the yard, began barking and howling with glee. The man was clearly quite cold, as he quickly killed the two-stroke engine and walked up to me. He pulled out his glove and he stuck out his hand. I quickly took it and I greeted the man. Special Agent Jones, he said. I looked at the man and I saw instantly that he was out of his element. Cold hands, red nose, and the constant shivers told me everything. And so I said to this ill-prepared man, Come on inside, Agent Jones. It's mighty cold out here. Once inside and seated with a cup of coffee, I finally asked, What would an FBI agent want with a bush rat like myself? The man straightened himself and said, The FBI would like to employ your services as a tracker, sir. Huh, well, I guess I was good at what I do, but I wasn't expecting that. I see. And what exactly do you want me to track? I asked. Well, uh, he stuttered. We're not exactly sure. Not sure, huh? I said puzzled. He explained what happened. A couple of teenagers were found on the old Pearl River, one with their skull smashed open, and one with his chest crushed. No scratches, bites, anything on them? I asked in bewilderment. Not one, he said. And where the hell is the old Pearl River at? He looked at me goofy and said, Louisiana. I've never been before, I said, and I don't think I would do much good to you down there. But you will, he assured. We have been searching for the best woodsman in the country, and we found him, he said confidently. I'll be damned if I flew my happy ass up here and froze my balls off on that snowmobile to go all the way back down south and settle for second best, he quipped. Well then... You've got yourself a hunter, I answered. And that is how I found myself alongside the old Pearl River, waist deep in the swamp water, sitting next to a swamp man named Shelby. Shelby was an alligator hunter that was hired for the use of his knowledge of the area, and more importantly, his airboat. You boys got anything yet? said Jake. Jake was a Marine Scout sniper until he was very recently recruited to be on this task force. Sorry, Jake, not shit, I told the sniper. Well, let's pull out for the night. I'm freezing out here, my feet are wet. Jones whined. Fine, was all I said in return. Jones was clearly more of a desk jockey than a field guy. But this was his team, and he was determined to be with us every step of the way. Let's get going then, Shelby whispered. We quietly crept back into the airboat. You're back, said Sarah. 
Sarah is the cryptozoologist and Agent Jones said that she could be of some help. Yeah, we're back. We'll only be gone six hours. I retorted. Ignoring my sarcasm, she said, I've been doing some research and I think I know what we're dealing with. Doubling down on my sarcasm. What? You don't believe what Jones told the public. You know, a bear that crushes people instead of chewing them up. She grinned and proudly stated, Nope, not even a little. Shelby fired up the boat, went and picked up Jones and Jake, and we all decided to regroup in the morning. A swamp ape, huh? Jake sneered. Sarah glared at him through her sunglasses and spoke. It sure as shit wasn't a bear, Jake. You saw the bodies. Yeah, that wasn't no black bear, was the short, athletic man's only reply. How do we kill it? Shelby asked. We don't, answered Sarah while staring at me. We trap it, she stated. Right then, Jones got a call and he went outside. How in the hell are we going to trap an 800 pound pissed off swamp monster? Jake intelligently asked. To trap an animal, you must know the animal, what it eats, how it walks, how intelligent it is, the way it thinks, and among other things, I informed. Shelby then stated the obvious. So go back to square one, find the damn thing. Just then, Jones came back to the table. We gotta go right now, he ordered. I'll explain on the way. Fucking A. Jake cursed as we pulled up to the scene. Eight pigs dead, five smashed skulls, and three ripped throats. We got out of Shelby's old Ford truck and quickly investigated the scene. They were all killed maybe three hours ago, and large, three-toed tracks with webbed feet were heading towards the swamp. I told Jones that I should start tracking now and the others should go get Shelby's boat. I can't send somebody alone out there. I'll go with you. He said. No, you can't. Someone has to stay and deal with the farmer and the press when they hear about this. I explained. Jake, what about you? Jones questioned. I left my M40 in my room. Jake confessed. What about me? Sarah asked. You ain't got no gun, though, said Shelby. I'll borrow your pistol, Sarah replied. Fine with me, I guess. I approved. Jones simply nodded, and Shelby handed her his old 1911. I already had my 45 Colts on my hip, so I pulled my Marlin 4570 out of Shelby's truck, and off into the swamp we went. For seven hours, we tracked the beast through the swamp. It was clearly quite intelligent, as it made almost no tracks as it moved through the forest and thus making my task very difficult. Finally, as we crept through the swamp, we heard a noise just ahead. I quickly motioned for Sarah to stay still, and then I saw the monster. It stood approximately 8 feet tall and roughly 400 pounds. The monster's arms had to be at least 5 feet long and the thing was covered in a reddish brown fur. Almost the instant I saw the creature, I smelled it. It had the horrible stench of rotten milk and wet dog. But the thing that seemed the strangest to me was its eyes, red and menacing, with a slight glow to them. I put the lever gun against my shoulder and I took aim. Sarah squeezed my right arm slightly. Please don't, she asked. I locked eyes with her and lowered my weapon with a slight sigh. The monster let out a deep, loud howl and continued into the swamp. That night, I laid in my shitty motel bed and I thought about why I didn't shoot the monster. I mean, I had a clear shot. Even if I told Jones that I didn't, into 4570, I could have dropped it before I knew what hit him. I arrived at the conclusion that I didn't take the shot because Sarah had asked me not to. Sarah... She was that kind of person. This whole time she had been trying to capture it, not kill. 
Needless to say, after that night, I was much more interested in my newfound profession and my new partner. Perfect, said Jones. Hell yeah, Jake agreed. And so he walks in, hits the tripwire, and the gate falls, and he can't get out. Sarah confirmed. Yep, was my reply. Earlier that morning, I designed a cage trap for our prey. Okay, Shelby, take Jake into the swamp and find a good spot for this thing. I and you will go into town and get someone to start building this thing, Jones stated. What about me? Asked Sarah. Find out as much as you can about our little friend, and we'll meet up when Jones and I are done. Jones simply nodded in agreement with my statement. I couldn't find much out on our buddy, but from what I did find, it seems like he's a swamp Bigfoot, but meaner and with some serious B.O. Sarah said as she sat down next to me. She had decided to get a nicer hotel suite, and so she wanted me to meet here. In my experience, meaner is really more territorial. I softly corrected it. Either way, at least I'll have you here. She said with a smirk. I'll protect you. I said and with a laugh. I don't need your protection. I just know that I can run faster than you. She confessed with a laugh. I grinned and I looked at the clock. I better get going. I told her. I'll show you the door. She offered. After stepping to the other side of the doorway, I turned to say goodnight. She softly grabbed my hand and said, Thanks for the other night. You know, not shooting. Not a problem. You're welcome. I replied. Good night, she said. Good night, Sarah. You really think it's gonna work? Sarah asked quietly. It will. It was all I said in return. The plan was simple. We had figured out that he was like a bear, and that he likes his food rotten. He was seen digging out those pig carcasses and carrying one back into the swamp, and so we dug up the rest of them and were using them as bait. After about five hours of waiting, the beast finally showed itself slowly sulking out of the swamp, about 25 yards directly in front of Sarah and me. Eyes on. I whispered into the radio to Jake and Jones on the opposite side of the trap. The beast rose up, sniffed the air and looked for danger. A slight snap came from my right side. I looked to see that Sarah had tripped, and she was now scared shitless. Turning my eyes back to the beast, I found those big, red eyes were locked on me. As soon as we had locked eyes, it charged. I had an idea that I prayed would work. I motioned for Sarah to stay down and started running towards the trap at 25 feet away. I heard it chasing after me, but it was gaining fast. I got directly in front of the trap door. I whirled around to see that it had caught up. He leapt towards me, but I dodged him. He spun around to face me and with his back now to the door, his face was met with the butt of my rifle. He fell backwards into the trap, triggering it. The iron gate dropped, locking him inside. The beast let out a roar, a hell of an angry roar that sent shivers down my back. Holy shit, Jake exclaimed, now on my side. Yeah, I said back. Holy shit. The FBI was finishing loading up the beast into the truck when Jones had approached me. So, what did you think of the team? He asked. My gaze shifted towards Sarah as she was talking to some agent about the beast. I liked everybody, I answered. Jones catching my gaze said with a smirk, some more than others? My grin was my only reply. Would you be interested in ever doing hunts like this again? Everybody else already agreed. He asked in a more serious tone. I thought for a moment and then I said, Yeah, 
I'll hunt with you folks anytime. I pulled into the little mountain town at about 10.30 a.m. I looked at the thermostat on the dash of the new Dodge. It read a bone chilling, negative 24. I pulled into the newly abandoned campground and I found the five Arctic grade tent set I recommended for this hunt. Me, Shelby, Jake, and Sarah would all get one of the four smaller private tents to ourselves, while Agent Jones would stay in the larger tent that would double as his headquarters and cafeteria for this hunt. I unloaded the 40 Huskies out of the custom-built dog box on the back of the Dodge and set up a lean-to structure that would serve as their house for the next couple of weeks. I then made my way to the HQ tent and checked the fire burning in the wood-burning stove. It was nearly out. I mentally questioned my team's basic winter survival abilities while I patiently built a roaring fire to warm the tent. I was enjoying the warmth of the fire when I heard the black SUV pull into the campsite. Whoa, nice ride! Jake commented on the new truck. I thought you drove an old Ford. Sarah questioned. I did. I replied while looking sharply at Jones. Jake, putting two and two together, jokingly questioned. You bought him a truck? Where's my bonus? Jones, always serious, answered. I, we, we needed dogs and do you know another musher with a security clearance? Shelby then broke into our conversation. Come on, the pizza's getting cold. We went inside and ate and then Jones broke the small talk. We all knew why we were here, but Jones finally explained in detail what had happened. It turns out that a group of five snowmobilers went into the back country for a weekend trip. They were found dead the following Tuesday. Or should I say, what was left of them was found dead. And the bodies were severely mutilated, eaten by some strange beast. The bodies were found in the campsite, which had been completely trashed by whatever had done this. All five snowmobiles were found at the campsite unharmed, in operating condition, meaning that whatever happened, it happened so fast that they couldn't run to the machines to escape. There were no tracks found due to high winds having blown them all away. The locals had removed the bodies but it had not disturbed anything else, and so we decided to head to the crime scene early the next morning to assess the situation properly. At daybreak, I hitched teams of dogs to the 14 dog sets that I had brought with me. Two racing style sleds to be used to move quickly if needed, nicknamed the Corvette Sleds by Jake. A large, freighting style sled for moving bulk gear, the Trucker Sled. And a multi-passenger touring style sled, the Station Wagon. I gave everybody a crash course in dog mushing and assigned everybody to a sled. I was to lead the way on a Corvette sled, followed by Jake on the trucker sled, and then Jones and Shelby on the station wagon, and then Sarah in the rear on a Corvette sled. The trip was pure hell for me. Jake complained constantly about not getting a Corvette sled, and Jones couldn't keep from falling off. Shelby grumbled nonstop about the cold. In fact, the only person who seemed to seemingly enjoy the trip was Sarah who learned the difficult task of steering the sled with ease, never once complaining. She was pretty impressive for a rookie musher, and I'm not easily impressed. We arrived at the murder scene after a couple of hours. They had picked a good spot for a camp, surrounded on three sides by trees, but still in the heart of the mountains. Perfect riding country. I quickly surveyed the small campsite, there were three small arctic grade tents, equipped with small propane heaters for warmth. Apparently the victims had been a group of two women and three men. The tents were collapsed from the snowstorm on the night of the murder. But upon entering the last semi-standing tent, I found about a dozen beer cans scattered on the floor of the tent with another 12 pack in the corner. I kicked around in the snow and I found the remains of a campfire. It had burned to nothing but ashes, telling me that it had burned down on its own and it was not put out. So the campers must have been awake at the start of the attack. Jones approached me. 
what do you think happened? Whatever it was hit so hard and fast that they couldn't even get to their snowmobiles. And it didn't help that these folks were probably drunk. Sitting around the campfire and not paying attention. After a brief silence, Jones spoke up. I've got a couple things to fill out here, and I want to take some pictures of the scene. I thought of the best thing to do and responded. I'm going to go search around there in the trees. The wind wouldn't have hit them so badly and maybe I could find some tracks. The group of trees was roughly 1,000 yards up the mountain to the north, further away from the town and the valley below. The most likely spot for an animal to retreat to. Jones looked at the trees and replied, Them trees look a good distance away. Take your radio and have Jake go along with you. I nodded in agreement and I found Jake sitting on one of the dog sides. Hey Jake, you want to take a look up there in that group of trees? I said motioning to the said trees. He slowly rose from his sled, glanced up at the trees up ahead and said, Sure, I guess. You got your rifle? I casually asked. Nah, I left it back at the tent, he answered. Got a sidearm? I questioned, hoping that he wouldn't have been foolish as to come to the backcountry unarmed. Yeah, I've got my Glock, he answered. Okay, do you carry a 40 Smith & Wesson or a 45 ACP? I curiously replied, slightly relieved. A 9x19mm Parabellum, what about you? He asked. A 9mm? What the hell are you going to do with a 9mm? I asked, quite aggravated. What do you mean? He asked, completely bewildered. I mean, we're not fighting people. Whatever we are out here hunting ripped three people apart before any one of them could do a damn thing about it. You think you're going to put that down with something that takes multiple shots to kill a person? I stated now, quite angry at his ignorance. He returned my anger in kind. Go to hell, Josh. Who the hell do you think you are? I'll carry what I damn well please. You like to walk around like you're in charge or something, but hear me now. You ain't my superior. For a moment, I considered knocking his teeth out for his ignorance and his attitude. But before I could act, Jones stepped between us. Settle down, you two. He said angrily. I didn't make this team fight against ourselves, damn it. He shouted. Pausing for a moment and then continuing. Shelby, why don't you go with Josh? Fuck that. Oh, God damn it. Jake responded. Jones looked at me for confirmation. I just nodded once. Jake, go ahead and jump on Sarah's Corvette sled. The snow is hard on top but icy. We'll have to put booties on the dogs to protect their feet. I directed Jake. He nodded once in confirmation. I quickly put the booties on the dogs and I looked up to see Jake on the runners on his sled. And off we went. We arrived at the tree line and quickly anchored off the dogs. I walked over to help Jake and I saw a small speck of blood on one of his leader's paw. Also noticing that one of her booties was missing. God damn it, I said with clear aggravation. What? Jake asked. Upon closer inspection, I found that he had put several booties on wrong so that they could easily fall off. You put the damn booties on wrong, I answered. Excuse me? Jake said sarcastically. I shook my head and replied. I think I'll fix it. It would have worked better. Kiss my ass, was his reply. I started to head into the woods and he soon started to follow. We searched for a couple of hours and an uneasy silence until I found a track. Hey, come here, I motioned for Jake. What in God's name is that from? He asked. I don't know, I said. The track was about two foot long and one foot wide, with long toes ending with six inch long claws. They were fresh, fresher than they should have been. They're heading north, I said, but I want to see where they came from. 
Follow the tracks backwards to find out. I told Jake. Sure, he answered. And take my rifle. I wouldn't want this thing to shove that 9mm up your ass. I mocked. Haha, really funny. He replied, obviously annoyed. I began following the tracks northward, chuckling lightly to myself. What kind of fool would come up here with a damn pea shooter? Jake didn't strike me as an idiot, but now I found myself questioning my teammate. Even if he carried a small pistol and an adequate rifle, he would at least be able to walk safely, but no. The dumbass left his rifle at camp. So now, I'm left with nothing but my 45 Colt. While adequate, it lacked the range and sure knockdown power of my 4570. My internal rant was interrupted by the slightest movement out of the corner of my eye. I quickly spun towards it, crouched and focused my sight on it. The beast was climbing up a steep bluff 250 yards to my 10 o'clock. It was too far to accurately tell but it looked to be at least 10 to 14 feet tall, with what looked like 3 foot antlers growing from its head. It finally reached a small ledge and stood looking on the valley below him. I slowly pulled my pistol from its holster, knowing that it would be useless at this range, but the familiar weight in my hand was reassuring. The beast luckily did not see me, and turned and ducked into a low cave. I quickly made my way back down the mountain with caution. Finally, I made my way back to the two park dog teams, where Jake was waiting for me. Where the hell have you been? He questioned, handing back my rifle. I saw it, I replied. Seen what? He asked with curiosity. To hell if I know, I replied. We quickly readied the dog teams and made our way to the ruined campsite where everybody had been waiting. On our arrival, Joan started questioning. You two get lost? No, we found something, I replied. Found what? He asked. Tracks, coming from that ridge. Jake answered, pointing to the tall bluff about a mile to the west. Fresh, only about an hour or two old, I added. My guess is you followed him, Jones asked me. Yeah, I followed them, I answered. Well, what did you find? I don't really know. He nodded quickly. Sarah! He yelled. I quickly described the creature to Sarah while we packed our gear to go, answering any and all questions that she had. And then we quickly returned to our campsite. I started a fire in Joan's tent. No one else could. While Sarah started to research what I had seen, I decided to ask Jake more about what he saw. Hey Jake, you mentioned that you followed the tracks that led to that ridge. What can you tell me about them? I asked. Yeah, them tracks led right to that ridge and well, it looked to me like it was watching. He answered. Watching us, huh? It must be pretty smart. I stated. I wonder why though. Jake asked to no one in particular. When wolves return to a kill, they'll sit back and they'll watch before they'll come back in on the carcass to make sure that nothing has disturbed it. If they see something wrong, they leave it alone. It's too risky for them. I answered. Yeah, if this thing is anything, it's smart. Sarah commented as she re-entered the tent. What do you have on it? I questioned. It's pretty scary. From what you described to me, I think it's what they call a wendigo, Sarah answered. What's a wendigo? Jones asked. I've heard a little from some of the native guides and they say a wendigo is like a spirit of the forest or something. They say that a wendigo represents the evil of cannibalism. That if a person eats another, they become a wendigo. They say that a wendigo can drive a man mad and then possess him making him crave human flesh. Wendigos often can represent extreme hunger cold, and any sort of evil really. But I was always told it was just a legend. I informed the group. 
but our buddy didn't possess anything. And nobody ate no one, so that doesn't cover it, Shelby pointed out. Science tells us that most legends are really just exaggerated versions of the truth, Sarah said. From what I've learned about them is that they are a lot like the Yeti, but a thinner, taller version, she added. So Bigfoot's Eskimo cousin, Jake asked Shirley. Pretty much, Sarah confirmed. So how do we trap it? Jones asked. It's a cave dwelling creature. So the thing to do is wait until it leaves its cave. Set your trap in the cave and simply wait until it returns. One problem though, I stated. What is it? Asked Jones. That cave trap method. It works with a bear or a wolf when they leave to go hunting. But this thing leaves to hunt people. I answered. We'll close the whole area to people, blame avalanche damage or something, said Jones. Josh, drop some design for a trap and I'll have a local start building it immediately. And then I'll need you to head out into the backcountry and tell everybody to go home. I don't need anybody else getting killed. Take someone with you. He issued me the order and I simply nodded my head and went to work. It was a good plan. I drew up an easy design for a large cage trap and sent Jones on his way. I thought about who to take and quickly decided on Sarah, as she was the best musher on the team, making for a much quicker trip. Sarah, you busy? I asked. No, not really, why? She answered. I need somebody that can actually ride a sled to help me evacuate the area. I was wondering if you want to come, I said. Sure, let me grab my gear, she said. She went into her tent and then re-emerged a few minutes later, with her winter gear and a pistol on her hip. What are you carrying? I asked. Oh, just my dad's old 357 mag, she answered nonchalantly. I smirked to myself as we were heading out, knowing Jake would be embarrassed to know that even inexperienced Sarah knew to carry a large pistol. We searched the surrounding main countryside. We found a few different groups of snowmobilers and sent them home. Some gave trouble but no one argued once I showed them my FBI badge that Jones had supplied me. Things took a drastic turn when we were on our way back to camp. We were mushing along a trail that ran on top of a steep bluff that sloped down into a heavily forested valley and eventually a frozen river. And that is where we saw it. The beast was following the river north, the opposite way that we were traveling. I stopped the team and I anchored the still fresh dogs off to a nearby tree, quietly instructing Sarah to do the same. Do you see it? She whispered. Yeah. I responded, pointing at it through the various trees. I retrieved my rifle and my binoculars from my sled bag to try to get a better view. As I said, the creature was heading north along the river, so I figured that it was probably leaving its den. As its den was located by the southwest of our position, it was probably hungry and looking for food. I couldn't find it. You got your phone? I asked. Yeah. Call Jake and Shelby. Tell them to haul their ass out here. I commanded. What about Jones? Sarah asked. Call him after Jake. What are you going to do? The thing is killing and eating people. I've got no choice. I answered. She shook her head slightly in approval, although I knew she was disappointed. I know, she sighed. I quickly found the creature in the valley below, still oblivious to our presence. The wind was coming from the northwest, definitely in my favor. I strapped on my snowshoes and I began descending into the cliff. I made my way down along the river and silently started north. When I last saw the beast, it was a little over a mile ahead of me, but because the snow was deep it was moving slowly, much slower than me with my snowshoes. It took me over an hour and it was almost dark when I found it. It had stopped at an unfrozen spot of the river to get a drink when I had spotted it and so I silently laid on the ground and slowly crawled through the snow, its cold stinging my face, 
to a nearby ice-covered log. I steadied my rifle on the log, taking aim, and then slowly cocking the rifle's hammer with a metallic click. The beast must have heard the click because it suddenly turned and stood just as I had fired. The bullet hit the animal on its hip, knocking it to the ground on its stomach. The creature let out a pain towel as it struggled fruitlessly to get to its feet. I rose from my shooting position and approached the beast intending to put the damn thing out of its misery. Just as I shouldered the rifle and worked its lever action, I heard Sarah scream. Wait! She yelled. I turned and looked down the river to see Jake and Sarah about 100 yards away approaching quickly on the station wagon. They pulled up beside me and stopped the sled. Trank darts, Jake said, holding up an air-powered dart gun. He walked over and he shot the animal with one, and within a couple minutes, it was out like a light. Do you think it will live? Jake asked. It should, I only shot it in the hip, I answered. Yeah, about that, Jake said smirking. It moved at the last second, I explained. Uh-huh. Jake answered, still smirking. At least I brought my rifle. I retorted with my own smirk. Okay, fine, Jake said, chuckling slightly. How are we going to get this thing out of here? I wondered out loud. Jones is on his way with a helicopter and some agents. They'll take it from here, Sarah answered. Two hours later, I was helping to load the still-sleeping cryptid in the back of a semi-truck to be hauled off to who knows where, and after we finished up, Jones approached me. You did another excellent job here, Josh, he complimented. Just doing my job, I answered. So can I count you on for more hunts in the future, he asked. Of course, any time. First of all, I would like to apologize if I ever had hurt anybody in the past. If you were only trying to be nice to me, and I dismissed it as you trying to get too close for comfort, I do apologize. My whole personality lies on a very narrow spectrum of psychology. I have no idea how to engage myself in any form of interaction with another human being. I'm a lost cause. The only source of light in my life is my fading and dissonant memories of a past life that I used to have many years ago. It's the only thing I am barely holding on to these days. One slip and down the hole I fall. A few months ago, I decided to make one of the most reckless and expensive purchases in my entire life. It was purely out of loneliness and desperation. Growing up in one of Russia's northernmost town with a mother who was struggling with depression herself had contributed to my own doom. I had been struggling with depression for years and it got worse when my mother passed away six years ago. I had reached the point where I had already started considering suicide. I had no other family or close friends and I was forced to swallow all my disappointments over things that did not work out well in my life for me alone. I worked from home so I didn't have to deal with people directly. My Polish friend, Philip, whom I occasionally bonded with over our mutual interest in photography, suggested that I go to see a psychiatrist. What? That's only what rich people do. I'm not rich. I dismissed it while editing some photos on my laptop. You are not married, no kids, live alone. Nothing to lose. Well, that hurt. But he had a point. That nobody would cry for me if I died. So who cared if I lost my mind tomorrow or the next month? I answered nonchalantly. I care. I cry if you die. We are friends. No. 
That simple and little act of kindness from him was the reason why I finally gave in and reluctantly booked an appointment with one of the most prominent psychiatrists in my town. She was a really nice and patient woman. She would ask if I felt okay today and would like to proceed with our session or not. At first, I was really hesitant to confide in her, a complete stranger. But her kindness and patience finally paid off and I gradually started to trust her more with each session that we had. She told me that I showed signs of severe social inhibition and the only way I could deal with it was to try and open up and trust people more, starting with her and my friend Philip. She also encouraged me to be more spontaneous and to stop overthinking too much. Take a long vacation or go shopping, she suggested. But there would be a lot of people there. Exactly. Face your fears. You said you like photography, correct? Why don't you go out and take as many pictures as you can? Select the best pictures that make you smile or remind you of positive thoughts each time you look at them. Print them and frame them on your wall. And so I did. I started with taking candid pictures of passers-by in front of my house. And then I gathered courage to go to the playground nearby and I took pictures of children and their parents. One thing at a time, she said. And she also told me to reward myself with something nice each time I managed to complete these tasks and overcome the obstacles one by one. I faced my fears. She said that I had been living alone for too long, which was not good in my case. She suggested that I put my house up for rent and to move in with a friend, which was ridiculous. First, the house was the only valuable thing that I had ever owned, and it held so many loving memories of my dear mother. Second, I am a compulsive hoarder and did not think anybody would be patient enough to put up with my antics. But again, I knew she was right. Everything that she had suggested I do up to that point had been proven to actually elevate my self-esteem. So I decided to do something spontaneous like she had suggested earlier. I went shopping. I originally wanted to adopt a puppy. I do not hate animals, just to be clear. But I also don't have any particular interest in them. I think handling pets is time consuming and I'm not patient enough to deal with it. But I thought maybe adopting a puppy would be a good thing for me to learn how to take care of other beings other than myself. And so I went to a nearby animal house where they take in strays from all over town, nurse them until they are ready for adoption. But then on my way there, an email notification blipped on my screen as I saw paying attention to Google Maps. I clicked on it. It was a forwarded message from an unknown sender containing a pamphlet from an unfamiliar company named Depresso Incorporated. The tagline read, Feeling depressed? Suicidal? Well, it's time to stop. Be positive. I scrolled through the message and realized that it was an advertisement for a recently released smart android robot called Depresso Plus and that supposedly assists people with mental illnesses in dealing with their anxiety and suicidal thoughts. There were also pictures of a small slender humanoid robot, which came in three different colors, dark cyan, maroon, and teal. Its functions were just like any virtual assistant out there. The only differences are it's a fully autonomous robot, and its main purpose is to assist people with mental illness. It can arrange your schedule, remind you to take medication, and even provide some motivational quotes every day to cheer you up and uplift your spirit. It is also equipped with a built-in small cylinder glass pocket on its rear to store a liquid sweet smelling fragrance for relaxation and sleep. And there is also a small flashlight like protrusion attached on its head that shoots out blue light as soon as you enter the room. And not to mention, it also shows cute happy smiley faces on its screen 24-7 to stimulate positive thoughts. And to top things off, it also has easy access to online interactive websites that deal with mental health, 
without exhausting and never-ending registration steps. It is specifically designed to assist people with mental health problems who are too shy to talk to somebody about it in fear of rejection because of negative stigmas associated with it. For some obvious reasons, it piqued my interest. It was rather expensive but not out of my financial reach. I was struggling for a moment. I was ready to adopt a puppy and bring it home to accompany me. But something in me that day told me that Depresso Plus was what I really needed. A companion in the form of non-human interactions. I waited for about a month until it was finally delivered to my house. And by the time I turned it on, the teal little guy who I nicknamed TD, short for Teal Depresso, not very creative I know, started to discharge this really sweet fruity scent that reminded me of my childhood back in the apple farm. Since then, TD had been helping me with my chaotic schedule and my sleep pattern. The first thing he did in the morning was to wake me up with a non-aggressive sounding alarm, and then cheerfully spewed out things like, Rise and shine, fighter. Remember, you are loved. Love for all, hatred for none. Be yourself. Change the world. And other motivational stuff which I'm pretty sure he found online. From time to time, it would also play calming sound effects like beach waves, tropical forest, and rain. I made a mistake once by trying one of its new sounds which was a whale singing. It gave me nightmares that night. I was drowning in dark water with a creepy whale singing around me. I know this may sound ridiculous to some, but as a person with mental illness who feared humiliation and rejection wherever I went, it felt really good sometimes to wake up to that, and not my own dark and painful thoughts. As it turned out, the robot really was as smart as how they had put it in the ad. It observes and it learns, said the tech guy who came to my house to deliver it. He looked like your typical nerd, with thick glasses and an ever-present wide grin. It gets smarter the more you interact with it. It'll remember the things that you say. He proceeded to mention that its advanced high-tech voice and facial recognition feature helps determine what mood you're in and will alarm your go-to person via phone call whenever you have anxiety or a panic attack. Who in my case is Philip, of course. As it gets even smarter, it will start randomly suggesting things without being asked to do any task first. He also suggested that I adjust my depressal's humor setting to no higher than 60% for the first week so I can take it seriously. But I decided to set it to 100% immediately. I needed to laugh. TD, will robots ever take over the world? I asked one night over dinner when I saw him slowly making his way into the dining room. Of course I had to ask him that. Nothing is impossible, senor. His distorted imitation of a human's voice responded. Well, so you will indeed enslave us. I would rather take dogs. Humans are horrible looking. And then his square-shaped torso started bouncing up and down, and a screeching horrible sound came out as he tried to imitate an evil laugh. Oh... I giggled for the first time since Philip fell off his bike during one of our trips weeks ago. So you think I'm ugly? That's really depressing. No, I don't think you're ugly. I think you are good looking enough. But a little nose job should be okay. I giggled louder. Come on, that's rude, TD. Humans spend too much time on their appearance. Do they know what happens to their faces underground when they die? My smile faded a bit. Okay, that's creepy. I am not programmed to invoke fear in you, as it is not encouraged to do so. But I can do some research for you online. No, thanks. What's my schedule for tonight? I tested him. 
Your sleep time starts within two hours, four minutes, and three seconds from now. Do not forget to take your medicine. Your alarm has been set for 6.15 a.m. Thank you, TD. I would like to recommend you that my fragrance is running out. I can order for you online if you wish for me to. Green apple and peppermint. Please do. It had been about two months since TD had arrived, and I'd already started to feel a bit better when things took a dark turn. The only thing that creeped me out about him before was his comment on death. But what he said a few weeks later really sent a chill down my spine. I just finished ordering online food on the small screen attached to his chest, and when he suggested that, I stopped consuming junk food because it has been proved scientifically that excessive consumption of junk food may lead to diseases that can reduce lifespan by 10 years. Oh please, TD, not again. I rolled my eyes at him, as usual, pretending he's an actual human being. It made me feel calm and relaxed doing that. You will die a horrible death, alone and in immense pain if you do not listen to me. His headlights turning a dark red for a split second, as he spoke nonchalantly. What did you just say? I asked him, really didn't expect that from him. Excessive consumption of junk food is not healthy. No, before that. I do not understand the question. Please repeat. Your sleep time starts in one hour, 15 minutes, and 27 seconds from now. I stood there for a while, still trying to figure out what had just happened. I wondered if it was only a glitch, and then decided maybe it was the humor setting acting up. TD, set your humor at 80%. His blue light blipped for a few seconds, as it always did when he was processing a command, and then... Done. His light turned green for a second, and then back to its usual fluorescent blue. I turned him off that night for the first time, and I went straight to bed after dinner, still feeling uneasy. I called Depresso Incorporated the following morning to inform them about this glitch, and they assured me that the only technical error the robots had was getting infected with a virus and that they had only happened because their owner had opened unsafe websites. I could tell the guy on the other end sounded a bit uninterested and bored but he told me to call them back again if it ever happened. A few weeks ago, I invited Philip over for dinner and he came with his wife Alicia and their 10-year-old daughter Amelia. I had been friends with Philip for many years now, so his family already knew what to expect. When the clock struck 8, we were already in the living room talking enthusiastically over glasses of wine about our future trips across Russia. And then, I don't know why, I decided to show TD to them. As soon as I turned him on, he started with the usual greetings. Good evening. How can I help you tonight? They all stared at TD in amazement, as if this was the coolest thing they had ever seen, especially little Amelia. After I told him to recognize their voices and faces, TD started to bounce up and down heartily. More human friends. More slaves in the future. Ha ha ha. I said his humor at 80%. I answered Philip's quizzical look. Hey, I need to laugh more, don't I? Talk to him, sweetie. It's okay. Her mother encouraged her. Do you have friends? She asked, wide-eyed in excitement. Yes, my owner is my friend, but his feet smell a bit. Everyone started laughing, including me. I was in a really good mood that night. It had been months since I had people over for dinner, and I really liked Philip and his family. Go on. I gestured to Amelia. Would you like to be my friend? We are already friends. I recognized your voice in your face. 
You are Amelia. She smiled and exchanged excited looks with her father. Do you have a friend, Amelia? Yes, I do. Her name is Hannah. I have a picture of me and her at school on my mom's phone. Would you like to see it? Without waiting for TD to answer, she gestured to her mom who was already scrolling through her phone gallery to look for the picture. There. She held the phone out to show it to TD. Hannah Nowak lives on address redacted. Nine years, four months, three weeks, two days old. How did it? Philip's voice trailed off. Well, it has access to online information. Maybe she's on Facebook? I asked. She's my best friend, continued Amelia, not paying attention to the confused look on her parents' faces. Hannah Nowak, species, female, human, nine years, four months, three weeks, two days old. Nationality, Russian. Born on July 5th, 2010. Unspecified as to place of birth. I highly recommend you stop associating yourself with her. This time, I could not help but exchange a stunned look with Philip. Why is that? Asked Amelia, looking really hurt and confused. I am sorry. I do not understand the question. Replied TD. His blue light is still blipping. Why do you think Amelia and Hannah Nowak should stop being friends with each other? From my observations and calculations of Hannah Nowak's behavior and life condition, there is a high possibility that she will tend to excessive and addictive use of drugs by the early age of puberty. She will also be likely to engage in various practices of unsafe and premarital sex by the age of 13. If the situation had been different, I would have laughed my ass off. But the looks on their faces that night made me realize that they found it too disturbing, even though Alicia tried her best to look convincingly amused as she laughed, though, her pale face betrayed her. I'm so sorry. It must be a glitch with its humor setting. I already toned it down. I said. TD, set your humor at 50%. His blue light blipped. Done. Your sleep time starts in 30 minutes and 17 seconds. Do not forget to take your medicine. Oh, you're going to bed soon. Asked Philip, looking guilty. Never mind, you know I've tried to improve my health. It's important, the psychiatrist says. Oh, hey, how's it going by the way? Pretty good. We've had a good start, and it's getting better. Honey, could you please excuse us for a bit and go play games on Mommy's phone in the TV room? Alicia asked her daughter, whose attention was still fixed on TD. Does it speak Polish? She asked. TD. I guess so. TD, activate Polish in your language setting and voice. His blue light blipped again. Dobry vietso. Amelia's face lit up again. Okay, go play with TD now, said Alicia to her daughter. Don't ask it creepy questions, sweetie. Philip chimed in and we all started laughing nervously. Man, that thing is crazy. Oh, come on. It's helped me a lot with organizing my schedule and stuff. Besides... It feels like I have an actual human companion around the house. This may sound unbelievable, but that robot is actually really good at cracking me up. It may come across a bit creepy, but hey, at least I'm laughing, right? We started talking about my medication, treatments and sessions with my psychiatrist for a bit, and Philip told me that if I ever needed anything, I should never hesitate to ask them for help. It really made me feel good knowing that there were people who genuinely cared about me and my well-being when I myself had almost given up on life. The clock struck nine and Philip had just only said they needed to go home and let me rest when suddenly, a blood-curdling scream cut through the air. 
I felt a distinct sensation of cold tingling passing through my chest. Alarmed, we all rushed into the next room and found Amelia sitting on the couch in front of the TV, hugging herself, shaking all over and still screaming, her hands covering her ears. TD was standing right in front of her. Sweetie, what's wrong? Philip lifted her off the couch and pulled her into his arms. It's okay, it's okay. I grabbed the robot hastily and took him out of view and threw it across the hallway, not bothering to check if he got dented or broken from the impact, and then returned to my upset guess. Philip and Alicia were still talking rapidly in Polish, with their obviously trembling daughter, asking her questions I believed, both looking extremely pale. What happened? I asked, my heart was beating so fast. Is she hurt? God, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have brought that stupid thing out. My eyes had already started to get watery. No, no, it's okay. I'm going to go outside and calm her down. Said Alicia and then she exited the room with the still hysterical girl in her arms. What was that about? I asked Philip. He didn't answer it away. He stood transfixed as if unable to comprehend what horror that had just revealed itself before his daughter's eyes. It, it said things. Bad things. Horrible things. He murmured, a distant look on his face. What, what did it say? It asked her if she was going to move away to Poland after the... Well, after the burial to live with her grandparents. What? What burial? I don't understand. It told her that I have cancer and that there is no cure for it and that I'm going to die soon. But that's impossible. You're joking, right? It's a robot. It does not just randomly tell you shit if you haven't asked anything related to your first questions beforehand. And you don't have cancer for God's sake. So you say I'm making this up. Amelia made this up. No, I mean... I think we better get going now, my friend. It's okay, don't worry about Amelia. She's a strong kid. She'll forget this tomorrow. You take a rest now and you take care of yourself. Remember, do not hesitate to call me if you need anything, okay? Sleep did not come easily for me that night. As I lie awake, eyes wide open, staring at the dark ceiling of my room, I started wondering if what had happened was only a result of the glitch in TD's system. Another glitch. God, I would make sure Depresso Incorporated knew about this first thing in the morning. I thought to myself. But just like before, they had refused to take full responsibility of what had happened. I literally screamed at the guy at the phone when he matter-of-factly told me the robot is supposedly super smart and quick to learn by observing things around it. So far, there had not been any complaints at all regarding apparent glitches whatsoever. They suggested that I hard reset him and adjust his personality traits manually, no higher than 50% and to call back if the glitch still persists. I snapped at him, saying that if it ever happened again, I would drag it back to the store and make sure their customers know about it. The following week, my worst nightmare came true. Philip had been avoiding me since that awful night at my place. He hadn't returned my calls and messages and I was so sure I had lost my only friend. And then one afternoon, he called to ask if I would like to meet after work because there was something that he needed to tell me. We met at 7 because I had another session with my psychiatrist that afternoon that TD had reminded me of. He went to have a medical checkup after the day after the dinner at my place and found out that he had a pancreatic cancer. It could be controlled, yes, to prolong his life, but not cured. I think I took it harder than Philip himself. I was beyond devastated. My only friend. I couldn't believe it. But he calmly told me that it was okay, as I started to hyperventilate and bawl my eyes out. 
He made me promise to take care of his family after he's gone, and to survive no matter what happens. I was not listening to him at all for the rest of the evening. What scared me even more than my friend dying was the fact that what T.D. had said earlier had proven to be true. And that was the last time that I ever saw him alive. He took his own life a week later. He left a note. He didn't want to be a burden to his family, financially and emotionally. He could not let his wife and daughter watch him die a slow and agonizing death. He left them a small amount of money and Alicia had no choice but to return to Poland to live with her parents for a while. I don't understand. I could not help but feel there was something wrong about all of this. It just seemed off. I fell back into depression after Philip's death. Long gone were the days when I found a little hope in my friendships with anyone. Philip had been my rock, my voice of reason. I know it was so selfish of me after I made a promise to him that I would take care of his family, but it was all just too much. His sudden death only served as a dark reminder of my own impending doom. I started to drink heavily, which was something that I had never done before. I ignored everybody and I shut my life off, when finally came the scariest night of my life just yesterday. It had been a few weeks now after Philip's death. I was sick and emaciated. I had stopped eating days ago. I didn't even bother to turn the lights back on. I was neck deep in vast darkness, both physically and mentally, soon to be engulfed completely and never to be seen again. But somehow, a little voice at the back of my head that sounded like Philip's kept reminding me to hold on, to keep my head above the water, that I had made a promise. I decided to confront my fears again, to face them. I had already did it once and I was getting better. Don't give up. Face your fears. I opened my closet where TD had been resting for weeks and I brought him out. I stood there for a while in the dark and proceeded to turn him on. Soon, his blue lights started to blip excitedly, casting long shadows on the walls. A mist of scented air was ejected from his little pocket my favorite. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. How may I help you? I stood quiet for a while. I did not know what to say. It's stupid being afraid of this thing. A machine. An appliance. TD, what is my schedule for tonight? Was all I could mutter. You were expected to send a clarification email to Mrs. Lee yesterday regarding her wedding photos. Do you like me to reconfirm it? No. Your sleep time starts in 3 hours, 51 minutes, 4 seconds from now. TD, tell me how to hard reset your system. To reset my system, please press power button and release after my notification light turns green to confirm. Proceed to reset. What day is it? Today is Thursday. Thank you. I was about to go back to bed and lie down when suddenly, without being asked, TD started again. Would you like me to leave a note on your Facebook later? Its notification light started to dim and look grayish. A blue sad emoji face appeared on its screen. What note? Your suicide note. From my observations and calculations of your behavioral patterns and body language, there is a high possibility that your depression has reached the point of no return, and you will lose the instinct to survive and shift into a self-destructed mode within. I lifted it up and threw it onto the floor as hard as I could, and it broke into pieces that were strewn about everywhere with a loud crash. I am staying at a motel now. I dare not go back to my house. I'm afraid I'm running out of time. What should I do? I 
I feel like this is the right time to share my story. Especially since it's Christmas Eve, the anniversary of the incident. What happened that day so many years ago changed my life forever. I woke up just around 12 at night to go to the bathroom and to get a quick drink of water. At the time, I wasn't afraid of the dark and I had a great imagination. I always thought there was something under my bed waiting to grab me. I always had enough imagination to believe that I could reach up into the sky and grab the moon right from the atmosphere. I left the bathroom to go back to bed until I heard the sound of jingle bells ringing. This wouldn't have been the sound of Christmas carolers waiting outside my door because it was in the middle of the night. And so I went into the living room to find Santa, putting only one present under the tree. The reason he puts only one under the tree was probably that I had stopped him. Santa, is that you? Unexpectedly, in a low, croaky voice that sounded like a frog was being strained through a cheese grater, the man asked, Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, what are you doing up so late at night, young man? The man didn't look like Santa. It looked like he hadn't eaten anything in a week, and his voice sounded like death. And despite him being so skinny, I didn't suspect a thing about it. My parents had told me that Santa was real, and at that age, I believed it. I knew you were real, I said with excitement. Well, I'm here now, so of course that means I'm definitely real, Santa said. The cookies are in the kitchen if you want one, I said. At that age, I believed it was Santa. I did not comprehend the fact that this guy, or whatever the hell it was, was walking around my house. Hey kid, you want to see my sleigh? And of course I said yes. Who doesn't want to see Santa's sleigh? He took me outside and then I heard the sound of a door being locked. I didn't know this at the time, but he locked the door from the inside. There I was, standing right next to Santa's infamous sleigh. Rudolph and his red glowing nose and a huge bag of presents in the back. Do you Do want, you to, want get to get in? in? Santa asked with a sick, twisted grin. No thank you, I, I should probably go back to bed. I was now starting to suspect that this thing was not the real Santa. My parents had taught me about getting into a stranger's vehicle, and somewhere deep down inside my mind, I was able to figure out that this thing was not the real Santa. No, we were starting to have some fun. Santa tried to grab me, but I managed to back up just in time. I fell backward from backing up too far. When I got back up on my feet, Santa's face was torn from his skull and the reindeer. The reindeer were actually human. I ran to my front door, but it was locked. I ran away from the demon that I had welcomed into my home. I ran and ran until I found somewhere to hide. I found a garbage can that had some trash in it. I hid there until I heard the sound of footsteps, many of them. I think he could smell my fear because when I opened the trash can, Santa was standing there, a few feet away from me. I fell over within the trash can and I backed away from him, stunned, scared and confused. Don't you want to play with me and the elves? We have a lot of toys and candy back at the North Pole. No, you are not the real Santa. Santa wouldn't be this mean. I ran as fast as I could to my house, and thankfully, the spare key was under the welcome mat. 
When I got inside, the first thing I did was go over to the Christmas tree and look at the present that he had left under it. I was scared to open it because I knew that something bad was probably in the perfectly wrapped box. I opened it up to find a note and something else. The note said this, Can't wait to see you next year. Santa. And under the note was his face. His disgusting, bloody face. Do you want to know what the worst thing about it was? The face was smiling. I went to the bathroom and I literally puked my guts out. I thought my stomach was going to go into the toilet as well. I didn't get much sleep that night. When I opened presents with my family that day, I was scared because I thought he had left an extra present for me. But fortunately, there wasn't any more from him. From that day forward, I was scared of Christmas. I was even scared of December as a whole. I always think twice about my decisions. When I turned 40 and my kids were 7, the next 10 years were just as bad as when I was 5. There was a box outside of my front porch. I brought it inside to open it. I thought it was something that I had ordered for my kids. Unfortunately, it wasn't. There was a note inside of the box. It said, Look outside your window. I immediately looked out to find Santa and his human sleigh. Santa was smiling. That piece of shit decided to mess with me and my family. He had crossed the line that time, even though I hadn't seen him in many years. I shut the blinds and I got my shotgun out of my closet. I went outside and I found nothing. My kids were not there when I got the present, thank God. I've taught them the dangers of speaking to strangers and always tell them to say no if they ask them to do something. But that next Christmas, nothing happened. No letter, no boxes, not even an appearance from the skinny demon himself. Every day that it got closer to Christmas, the more terrified I got. I was getting random letters and boxes then, I would have to put most of the stuff in my car, which was not fun to do. The stuff that I've gotten in those boxes and letters range from a fingernail to a freaking dead dog. I was not happy when I got the dog, and I really hoped that my kids did not find out about this. I was having dreams about that demon Santa, some of which had been very horrible dreams. I feel like at any second, I would get my head chopped off. But things have changed. I have changed. So that's why I decided to get off my lazy ass and go back to my childhood home on Christmas Eve and kill that son of a bitch once and for all. On December 1st, 2015, I got a letter in the mail from the demon. It said, if you want to finish this, come back home. At first, I thought that he meant the home I was living in at the time. It took me a while to realize that he meant my childhood home. I wondered if anybody was living in the house. Probably not. I knew the whole community there was destroyed by an F4 tornado a few years ago. I waited until the night of Christmas Eve to go back. I told my wife that I had a business trip to attend to, and I packed up my shotgun, my phone, and the pistol loaded with silver bullets, just in case I couldn't kill the sucker with the regular shotgun slugs or bullets. I waited until night to go back, and when the clock struck midnight, I left with the mindset of ending this once and for all. When I got there, it was like a wasteland. The only thing I heard was the blizzard-like sounds in the night. I parked by a church a few blocks away from the home. 
I thought I'd heard music coming from the church, but no one was there, even though it was a Wednesday. Of course, I was expecting this to be a hard task to deal with. You can't mess with a demon and get away with it. I walked and walked until I got back to the house. It looked better than anything else on the street. Out of the snow appeared that familiar red hat and the sound of jingle bells covering the sounds of the snow, making it echo across the entire town. You finally decided to show up, said the familiar croaky voice, looking as skinny as ever. Santa didn't have his reindeer, but he brought something else with him. Suddenly, I heard the sound of giggling and little tiny footsteps. I looked over to my left to find ten little elves. They started running at me, so I pulled out my shotgun in which I killed all of them. I had one of those shotguns that could hold multiple rounds, so it was an easy task. I looked back to where Santa was standing before, but he wasn't there anymore. Did you miss me? He said behind me. I turned around and I pulled my pistol out. He was only seven feet away from me. Why are you doing this to me? I said out of frustration. Tears were starting to roll down my cheeks at this point. Because I knew you were awake. And that was your only error. Haven't you heard the song about me? All you had to do was stay in your bed. Was that cup of water worth it by any chance? No, but this bullet in your head will be. My finger was on the trigger, ready to blow his brains out. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You see, I can make a deal with you. In exchange for something that belongs to me, I'll grant you whatever your heart desires. Well, here's my side of the deal. Bang. I shot him straight through his heart. He went down quickly. I shot him a few more times in the head. It's great to say that he didn't get back up after that. I didn't want to make a deal with him. I was frustrated, tired, but somehow happy that this was all over. It took me 30-something years to finally put this to an end. I slowly went back to my car and when I got back inside, I called my wife and went to voicemail after a couple of rings. Honey, the meeting is over and I'm coming home tomorrow right after I get some rest at the hotel nearby. See you when getting home. I got into my car and I drove to the nearest hotel. I thought about what he was talking about. I can make a deal with you in exchange for something that belongs to me. What did that mean? He wanted his face back. I didn't realize that the entire time I had my gun pointed at him, that his face was still gone. I don't know what I did with it. It was probably in the garage somewhere. That's the last place I would probably put it. I went home to find that the box with the face in it was in the middle of the garage floor. I opened the box to find that the face was frowning. I didn't think it was weird at all, but thinking about it now gives me goosebumps. It was rotten and sunk like a person who had been dead for over a year. I was then unable to keep myself from puking all over the floor, and I put the damn thing in the trash. I had a nice Christmas with my family after that. I was able to finally get some rest after that was all over. When I was going to get that cup of water so many years ago, I never thought of that song once. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad. So be good, for goodness sake. Whenever I hear that song, it brings me chills. But I killed the monster, so I have nothing to be afraid of. I wonder if Mrs. Claus is just as bad as that jolly old fat man was. 
she's probably dead and gone by now. Along with her husband and everything else that worked for Emma. It's nice to say that the past five years have been great. One of my sons, Jacob, works for UPS. He is the one delivering the presents in December. My other son, Mike, coaches a Division I basketball team. Me and my wife, Jessica, stay at home, happily retired. Life is good. Very good. I'm guessing that's all I have to tell you since the demon is dead. Nothing scary has happened since. Unless you count the time that a huge spider was in the house. All I have to say now is that I hope you and your families have a great Christmas. Good night and goodbye. Since 2010, I've had a secret Santa. Since 2010, nobody has ever come forward to tell me it's them. I should preface that this is an elaborate prank by some vengeful ex or an old friend. Not one of the gifts I've been sent has ever been of that nature. In all honesty, so many of them have just been odd. It started in December of 2010. I was a university student and grappling with the loss of my father. Not physically, mind you, but mentally. He had suffered a debilitating stroke at the tail end of that year, and his mind had never truly recovered. Early onset Alzheimer's disease, they had called it. He was only 58. But still, he persisted and made the best of the life that he had left. Cracking jokes and showing an admittedly a slightly diminished vigor he was always known for. I remember coming home from a visit to his hospital bed one night, saying goodnight to my mom and driving back to my dorm a couple hundred miles away. It was long, but I needed the time to process my own emotions and get a good night's sleep in my own space. When I got back to my front reception, the concierge told me a package had been left for me. This was especially odd, as I didn't have any expected packages, and none of my close friends were the type to just send gifts to me out of the blue. But I accepted it, and I took it back to my dorm. Holding the black wrapped box carefully, a finger tucked under the delicate brown string. I set it down on my desk and I looked at the note attached. It was simple but each word held such weight that I felt my throat dry before I had even finished. Theo, yours is the road less traveled. Do not veer off of it. Your secret Santa. Flipping over the card, I saw the small phrase, Dumb Spiro Sparrow with the dot tour link attached to it. I quickly tried to check it out, but it presented me with a black screen and a passcode, and so I left it. They had known that I had been driving back here, but how? I had already gotten the news about my dad's stroke the day before, and I had been on campus ever since. Pressing on, I unwrapped the box and carefully lifted it up, revealing a most confusing sight that, at first, had my eyebrows raised, but would later have me terrified. Sitting on a satin pillow was a license plate covered in blood. My license plate. I immediately called the police, checked my car and quizzed the concierge on who had left it. Naturally, no route led me anywhere. Since my car was fine, number plates attached, and the package was sent to via courier, there was nothing to be done. I calmed myself down after a few hours and I set it aside, not wanting to get rid of it for fear of fraudsters, but terrified to keep it in sight. 
I moved the box with the rest of the things and I took the note to put on my desk. Maybe I would return to it one day when I felt up to it, but not now. The following year was far less kind. Dad suffered a burst in his aneurysm during open surgery to remove it and was put into a medically induced coma. Christmas was spent at his bedside in the ICU, urging him to wake up, but yielding no response. There is something so otherworldly about being in a room of people that aren't alive or dead, that is indescribable to those who have never experienced it. But you feel very much like you are walking in a realm not of your own. I would sit by his bedside for so long, trying to coax him out of his coma with music, stories about politics, anything, but to no avail. On Christmas Day, exhausted and emotionally spent, I kissed him on the forehead and I wished him well, leaving to spend it with my mother, at least. As I was leaving, however, the head nurse stopped me and pointed to another black box. Someone left you this, said they would knew they would find you here, she said, staring at it surprised. We normally get gifts for our patients, but this, this is unusual. It only then came back to me the year before. I took it with shaking hands and in my car, I began to inspect the next note. Theo, some nights are more dangerous than others. Be clear of mind. Your secret Santa. This time, there is a pill bottle filled to the brim with raisins and a small makeshift pump affixed to it like some macabre art piece. It felt sick. My head was spinning. Why would they do this? At the time when I was most vulnerable. I broke down in my car and screamed some songs on the way home to help shift the rising bile in my stomach, not wanting or capable of understanding such confusing actions at a time like this. And that was how it went. Year on year until this year. Some years, it would be a simple but elusive message about it, taking heed of the next year and others would be harder to ignore. In 2015, my mother passed from lung cancer and I was sent a box containing a small cassette tape labeled My First Mixtape for Mom and a note reading, Theo, there is as much joy to be found in memory as there is in sorrow. The key is balancing it. Your secret Santa. She died listening to my first mixtape. The tape went missing when I asked her to retrieve it from the hospice. I cried a lot that day with it on repeat, softly singing the same songs she would hum to me as I grew up. 2016. The year my daughter passed away was especially hard. A pain like no other ripped through my soul and threatened to take everything with it, leaving nothing but a hollowed out shell of a man in its wake. Being straight edge with no alcohol, drugs, or cigarettes in the system left the emotions raw and untinged by coping mechanisms, something my grief was desperate to gorge itself on. It was early December, a month since we had lost her and I was despondent, spending my time in my home and speaking to as few people as I could. Most knew to give me space, but that didn't stop the occasional well-wisher. A knock on the door. I ignored it. I wanted nothing to do with the living, hoping that they would simply go away and fade into obscurity, as I wished to do myself if time allowed for it. They knocked twice, and then a third time curtly, before I mustered the courage to get up and face the incessant stranger, only to be met once again with a black box and a note. My hands shook and my eyes watered as I turned the note over in my hands. Theo, 
I know the shadow looms over you, but do not let it blot out the small light you now keep. Your secret Santa. Accompanying this note was a small toy car, crushed from the roof inwards, red paint dripping down the sides. I ran out of my apartment block, screaming to the high heavens for who they were and demanding they came out and faced me. But my pained yelling was met with abject silence. I was distraught. My pain brought to the surface and mounds of salt rubbed into the wounds for a good measure. Instead of going back inside, I jumped into my car and I went round to the hospice where my father now resided. He was succumbing slowly but surely to the illness, and while it was forever painful to see him in that state, time spent with family around the holidays is always vital. He was asleep when I went in. His head dropped to the side in his armchair, while reading a favorite novel of his, snoring heavily as I forced a smile and I sat down. Comforted by the quiet of spending time with one person who would never ask me about the pain that I was holding on to, even if that was because he couldn't remember it happening. He began mumbling something under his breath, and I couldn't make it out. He had a habit of doing this when his energy was weak or if he couldn't quite get his words out, so I wasn't sure if it was his sleep talk or his inability to get up. I leaned in closer. Is everything okay, Dad? I asked, putting my ear closer to his mouth. Mm -hmm. Let it move. He grumbled between heavy breathing. Let what move? Is your leg falling asleep? No, the shadow. Let it move. He was a bit clearer this time and slowly pulled a hand up towards the far corner of his room. My eyes followed the direction of his finger, and just for a moment, I saw a shape twist in the background before fading completely. Chalking it up to tiredness and grief, I sighed and I put him into bed before seeing myself out. It's amazing what a trip can do for your misery sometimes, because when I got home that evening, while I was still riddled with grief, I had largely pushed the secret Santa incident to the back of my mind and resolved to work through what was going on, one step at a time. Sure enough, as time went on, I got better and I moved past it. 2017's Secret Santa Gift was one of my own books and emblazoned with small feet on the cover. The letter reading, Theo, grief takes small steps at a time but you will eventually take strides. Your secret Santa, along with the usual card. Another attempted crack in the tour link was met with failure. Last year was a diorama of an empty house with a body laying in bed, as poorly crafted Christmas decorations hung around the place, the front door boarded up. Theo, Isolation can be the most insidious pain. Give thanks when it is broken. Your secret Santa. In the spring, my ex-partner was found in her home. She had hung herself on Christmas Day and wasn't found for three months. She had shut the world out years ago, and the note she had left behind simply read, I am going to be with my daughter. I'm sorry, I'm going home. I was pained by her loss, but as it had been so many years since we saw one another, I was thankful that she had at least found her peace in a way that I never could. Again, I would ponder the secret Santa identity and try to crack the tour login, but to no avail. This year, however, was different. It was last week and I had just begun packing for my trip overseas. A year away was something I knew I desperately needed, and it was a prime way of pushing the reset button on everything. I loaded up the car and was almost ready to pull away when 
a black truck pulled up outside of the property. It looked like a UPS van, but had no markings, logos, or indications of the company. A young man stepped out. He was clad in a UPS style outfit, but black from head to toe, sporting a hoodie instead of a cap. Package for Theodore Lee, he asked. A low but friendly voice as I nodded and he handed me the box, before promptly returning on his heel and heading back to the van. Aren't you going to ask me to sign for it? I called back, holding the box carefully as he turned and our eyes met. Dumb Spiro Sparrow, Mr. Lee. He smiled and he drove off, turning a corner and out of sight. Unsure what to expect, I went indoors and I set the larger box down on the counter, unwrapping the familiar black paper and gently taking apart the string before looking at the note. Theo, these gifts have been many, but this will be the last. The pact is ending and it is time for the inheritance to pass. The choice is yours, as it's always been. Dumb Spiro Sparrow, you're a secret Santa. Inside was a sight that didn't just chill me to the bone, but left my eyes watering and my heart threatening to beat out of my chest. I called the hospice. No answer. I drove, breaking every speed limit imaginable to get there in time. Rushing through the doors as a flabbergasted receptionist called the head nurse over. The look on her face told me everything I needed to know, and I collapsed to my knees, sobbing uncontrollably. My dad, the last member of my family, had passed in his sleep. In the box was a photo of him holding me as an infant, with the tour link dutifully left above it once again. The word inheritance plastered across it. It took until tonight, but I mustered up the courage to finally look over the website. Entering the password sent me to a dark web market called Mots Emporium and offered various services like keeping tabs on someone, sending a death threat, or making someone disappear and with various descriptions of the types of people that had been assigned to their employment, though it sounded suspiciously like slavery to me. As soon as I went to the testimonial section, however, a video popped up. It was my dad, much younger and sitting at my hospital bed as a teen. He was tired, his brown hair already fading to gray and his hands shaking as he spoke to the camera. Hey son, if you're seeing this then, you're much much older and hopefully in a better place than you are right now. You probably had more than a few coincidences in your life, and things that, at the time, made you feel even worse than you can imagine. But, this was by design. He paused, turning the camera to my bed, as an emaciated, comatose me breathed slowly, hooked up to a ventilation machine. You tried to take your own life, Theo. They say that you're going to be different when you wake up. The note that you left makes no sense and I don't know what to do. But somebody approached me with an offer, and I don't think I can refuse it. He leaned in. Fear in his eyes, but the desperation of a parent apparent throughout. Son, something came to me late at night and told me they would look out for you in exchange for, well, me. If I do this, they say they'll find a way to keep you safe and happy. The trade-off is, well, he paused. Welling up as the realization overcame him. Well, I won't remember any of it. Not once. But it's worth it. 
in order to see you grow into the man I know you can be. To give you the chance, you deserve to beat this. Our family has a saying, Theo. While I breathe, I hope. Or to put it in the native tongue. Fresh tears rolled down my face as a shadow formed from the corner of the room and the two spoke in unison. Dumb Spiro, Sparrow. It's already too late for me. Most people in my situation would cry. Weep that death is only a few steps away. And they have absolutely no one to blame it on but themselves. But for me, I can't help but laugh. The situation is just so hilarious. I thought the starvation project would guarantee to launch my career to new heights. But instead, I will die from it. I have at my fingertips what I need to stop it too. But my pride and ego won't make it so. The irony is almost too delicious. Like the food I will never be able to consume again. Forgive me. I'm getting far too ahead of myself. For the past 40 or so years... I have created and managed all projects to come out to Alton Inc. You won't find information about us even in the darkest corners of the net, nor a single soul alive to know anything beyond our name. Our agents make very sure of that. They're watching me right now in fact, and I'm only able to send this off because of my security clearance. And even then... I can't explain all that much at the risk of my family mysteriously disappearing, but I will try to tell what I can. Alton Inc. deals with the, well, let's call it the more creative side of weaponry advancement. We're funded by multiple governments who help keep the lights on and then fight like wolves to outbid each other for our little creations. Trust me, any especially torturous device for things like putting down protests or having dissenters vanish you can come up with, we have made eons ago. My personal favorites were those nanites that could crawl into one's ear at night and drill a rather large hole into their skull, but I digress. Despite my title being of scientist, I've always considered myself more of an artist. And as an artist, you naturally strive to outdo yourself. For a while, I've been looking into ways to weaponize the mind itself. Sure, I can go for the easy route and simply make something that will cripple one with depression, anxiety, or even schizophrenia. But isn't that a little too obvious? Besides, man is ever resilient. The particularly strong could overcome such an obstacle. No, I would need something that would destroy the mind and body in unison. Something that only a gifted artist like me could make. And just like that, a brilliant idea popped into my head. Everybody loves a hearty meal, don't they? To keep them healthy and strong and full of that fighting spirit... The amygdala area of the brain is especially important in regulating your urge to eat. But what if there is such a substance that could modify that area? For it to change the brain's reaction to food as a hostile enemy they must reject and to starve themselves until they become nothing but skin and bones. And sure, there absolutely are means to keep them alive with such a condition. But I don't think any soldier would charge into battle with a feeding tube, or a country could keep the millions inflicted alive. And so, project number 4826 was born, or as I'd like to call it, 
the starvation project. I knew it was instantly going to be a challenge. My team and I have experimented with mind-altering stuff before, but never on something that required so much precision. The first experiments were immediate failures. All we succeeded in those first few subjects were completely shutting off their brains. While it was interesting to watch them just drop to the ground like that, it was hardly the result that we had wanted. The subject needed to slowly suffer to their painful death, wavering down an enemy's nerve as they witnessed that they too would suffer the same fate, resulting in, hopefully, their quick surrender. All of those tries and failures made me glad that I moved into the private sector. I could get as many test subjects as I needed without having to worry about that pesky thing called ethics. That's probably partly the reason we were able to do it in just those few short months. A surprisingly simple concoction, really. Anybody with some basic chemistry skills could have created it. Report 2-CD Gas Substance SLVI-5102 Revision number 2 created Contains the following chemical properties Redacted Allow the substance to be invisible to the naked eye Colorless and nearly odorless save the slight smell of burning it will be tested on patient number 88, and named Emma. Apparently number 88 was my own magic number. I can't recall anything about her all that well. All I remember about her is she had been a prisoner on death row, donated to us by a local jail. My, did she ever put up a struggle as she was tied into that chair? In the testing room, I stood intently through the glass as I gave the order for the gas to be released. In just a few seconds, and completely unbeknownst to her, she had been infected. Is... is that it? She stammered out, confused. Yes, the test has been concluded. I replied coldly. As a reward for your cooperation... We would like to award you with a little something. I entrust a smoked turkey as to your liking. An assistant entered her room with a fresh oven roasted turkey and promptly laughed. Um, yeah, sure. Why was that guy wearing a gas mask? Don't worry about him. I softly assured her. Please, enjoy your feast. You've earned it. I glared fiercely at her as she just stared at the meal. Is something wrong? I asked with a smirk. I'm not feeling all that hungry right now. Oh, I see. But please, do take a bite. I really don't think. I will have one of my assistants shove it down your throat if you don't. I hissed. Eat. Report 3-CR Test subject number 88 has been successfully infected. When attempting to consume an item of food, number 88 almost immediately vomited, upwards of 7 minutes and 27 seconds. When forced to eat other items, including chicken, applesauce, crackers, and stuffing, number 88 repeated the same reaction. This seems to prove that not only does SOVI-5102 make people adverse to food, but has the bonus effect of having the subject completely incapable of holding down any as well. Not unlike bulimia. Number 88 has been taken to a research room for further analysis. Report 4-RY Subject has been unable to hold down any food for one week. Number 88 does not report any nausea or has demonstrated any signs of food poisoning. However, the mere mention of food now makes the patient vomit. Number 88 also complains of weakness, dizziness, abdominal pain, 
and other symptoms common to starvation. Report 5-CY It has been two weeks since the original experiment. Number 88 has been retrained after being caught clawing violently at her own stomach, screaming that something is crawling in there. Number 88's mental and physical needs continue to deteriorate rapidly. Number 88's BMI is now at 13. The doctor has indicated that number 88 has only one week left until she dies of starvation, unless nourished by a feeding tube. At this point, I concluded that the experiment was a success. I ordered the team to start larger production of the substance. I honestly couldn't have been happier. This was something that no other person could have created, and I'm sure that it would make our client very, very happy. I could have simply left her to starve and die. She wasn't needed to the company after the project's conclusion. But I'm not completely devoid of humanity. I ordered a feeding tube for her. It was only fair for suffering so much, and keeping her alive for the rest of her natural life was a good deal for her part in making such a miraculous invention. I was so thankful, in fact that with assistance, I wanted to be the one to put it in her arm. I entered her room. She looked like, well, pure death. I could see every feature of her skeleton through her deflated skin, her eyes baggy and sunken as they could be. And did those eyes ever give me a glare? They spoke of pure malice, pure hatred for me. But not for long, I had hoped. Emma, I candidly stated, I am Mr. Darrell, the designer of this project and who you were speaking with that first day. I would like to personally thank you for your sacrifice for the betterment of science. As a reward for your bravery, I have decided to give you a feeding tube to keep you alive, monitored by staff members for the remainder of your natural life. I stared down to see her reaction but she just blankly stared, not so much as a quiver. I continued, While I cannot permit you to leave the premises, you will be provided with any entertainment within reasonable means. Still nothing. Her eyes felt even colder, shooting shivers on my spine. I understand your silence, but don't worry. Your mental facilities will soon be restored. I will now insert the tube. You will feel a slight. The moment I touched her, she suddenly reached over to me with her other arm and grabbed me by the collar. With the strength surprising up somebody in her condition, she managed to hold me long enough to spit in my face. I instinctively slapped her across the face, shattering her paper thin neck. The medical team rushed in to retrieve her body while I stormed off to the bathroom to clean off her horrendous deed. Damn it. She had even managed to get some in my mouth. I swished and I washed it out as much as I could, but this terrible metallic taste remained in my mouth. And from the little that was caught on my check, I noticed that it had an almost slime-like color. However, it was only during dinner time that I understood the true gravity of what she had done. Despite having felt starved all that afternoon, I now only noticed that my hunger seemed to have vanished. I tried to eat anyway, and the next thing I knew, I was hurling in the sink. Report 6-UW Despite best efforts otherwise, number 88 has been terminated. Those inflicted with SOVI-5021 are suspected to have the ability to spread symptoms of the substance through bodily fluids. Number 88's autopsy has demonstrated evidence that SOVI-5102 is capable of creating pathogens of itself in the infected bodily fluids. I have become infected myself through such means, 
and will be monitored to see if my symptoms are the same as the directly infected patient. It's been a week since I've submitted that report, and it's probably the last one that I will ever make again. Hypocritically, I have declined not to be put on life support like number 88. If I may never make art again, that is not a life worth living. I also did not research to start on an antidote. I did not devote these years just to vainly throw them all away. I will go the way I likely deserve, like a dog. I do not weep on my deathbed. I can only find joy in hilarity. The starvation project has been more successful than my wildest expectations. The client has already received the formula and date pertaining to SOVI-5102. It is completely out of my hands. The only question now is, when will the client use it? So, if you're ever going about your day, and your appetite suddenly vanishes, and the ever slight smell of burning wafts throughout the air, well, it's already too late for you. Isn't that hilarious? The roar of the symbolic V8 Hemi engine howled over the loud wind rushing through the open windows of my treasured 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. Cool fall air scraped the left side of my head, bringing water to my eyes as it violently blew my long straight bangs away from my face. Taking a hand off the steering wheel, I brushed the hair away from my eyes silently cursing at myself for putting off the chance to visit my aunt for a haircut. Holding down the accelerator, I quickly looked at the dimly lit speedometer needle sitting triumphantly at 130 miles per hour. Glancing up, the rearview mirror reflected the black road of Route 24, a rapidly retreating plane painted lines and streetlights stretching into the dark night behind me. Returning my focus forward to the barren road, illuminated only by my headlights, spilling into the rapidly moving tarmac. I am unable to make out the profile of any other cars on the road. It makes sense for this hour. The dash clock read, 3.39 AM. I maintained my gaze off the rearview mirror for a moment longer. Eyes straining into the darkness for any signs of other life on the road. The emptiness of the night stares back through the mirror, and my watering eyes begin to see twists and swirls in the darkness, almost as if tendrils were reaching out towards my car. A violent mass of metal and gasoline hurling through the night. Blinking, the swirling dissipated and the road behind me seems to have become more mundane, desolate, Empty. Safe. I breathed a sigh of relief and I eased my foot from the accelerator, allowing the car to slow down to 85 miles per hour. The average speed of most commuters on this southern Massachusetts roadway. As my heart began to slow, my mind raised, recounting the events that I had experienced earlier within the Freetown State Forest. The evening should have been identical to any other regular outing made to the 5,000 acre section of Government Park just north of Fall River, the city that I currently live in. It was a lazy Sunday afternoon, and so I decided to roll my old Dodge Challenger out from inside the storage space that I make monthly payments towards, just to house it. It may seem like a silly expense at $400 a month just to store an extra vehicle, but the tinkering and rebuilding of this machine with my old man over the years, before he eventually lost his battle with COPD, held many great memories. Keeping it safe was more than worth the money to me. I finished hosing away the foamy soap from the side panels of the vehicle, 
and was admiring the shine of the dirt free green paint when my phone buzzed in my pocket. The message was from my best friend Keegan, asking if I wanted to spend the rest of the afternoon hiking around the Freetown State Forest. He wanted to walk the ledge loop trail and, if we had time, explore some of the other trails that we knew the area had to offer. I shot a quick affirmative reply and tapped over to the conversation with my girlfriend Mackenzie. I quickly typed, You want to join Keegan and me on the hike at the Freetown Forest? A few moments later, Mackenzie replied, No thanks, Spencer. You know that place creeps me out. I know she's into shows like Ghost Adventures and has spent hours reading the community ghost stories that seem to trickle out of the Freetown State Forest. You don't live in an area labeled as part of the Bridgewater Triangle, without a few strange stories being told over time, I suppose. I smiled and replied, Suit yourself. Don't complain to me when I send you pictures of all the cute fur babies I see walking with their owners. After the immediate, oh, STFU response, I packed up my cleaning supplies and I fired up the Challenger, the loud engine happily purring en route to the trailhead. The next few hours of the afternoon passed like any other day. Keegan and I met in the parking lot, shouldered our hiking packs and spent the time wandering the trails and discussing our lives, the future and how we would run the world better than anyone else, if given the chance. We decided to rest at a spot locally known as The Ledge, the peak of an old granite quarry that was used for constructing many of the buildings in the area during the 19th century. One such building being the Taunton State Hospital, built around 1854. It's another supernatural location Mackenzie has pawned spooky stories about, Nowadays, the ledge in the quarry below is largely used as a teenage hangout, a spot for drinking, smoking, graffiti, and the occasional daredevil who has been known to jump into the small pond, 50 or 60 feet below the granite wall. I dropped my bag to the ground and unscrewed the cap of my metal water bottle, putting it to my mouth and taking a long sip of cool water. Keegan was lazily reclined in the ground, his bag still on his back and his fingers clasped behind his head, with his eyes closed into the dimming evening sky. He looked peaceful. His short undercut black hair was filled with product and it had been swept back into a modern style, which did match the black goatee that he let grow out on his chin. The way that he held his hands behind his head left his sharp facial features open to the sun. He always seemed to have a mind for fashion, and even while hiking, he was wearing designer clothing. Retrieving the last cliff bar that I had from my bag, I motioned towards the sky while sitting down on a small rock. It looks like it's getting dark pretty early today. We should probably start thinking about heading back to the cars now. Keegan shrugged and replied, Nah, it's fine. And plus I have some flashlights in my bag if it gets too dark. We can use those to find our way back to the cars. Let's hang out here for a bit longer. He reached into his bag and pulled out a worn pack of marble reds. He packed the cigarettes three times into his hand, and then pulled one out, placing it into his mouth. Extending his hand, he offered me one. I shook my head. You know I gave those up. I thought you did too. I guess this is why you wanted to stay a little longer, huh? Does Jen know you're back to smoking? He pulled a cheap plastic lighter from his pocket and lit the dust stick in his mouth. Breathing in deeply and then exhaling smoke through his nose, he replied, No, and I would appreciate it if you didn't tell Mackenzie either. He chuckled. Last time she told Jen and I was in a whirl of shit. It was like being grounded in my own house. I shrugged and smiled. Yeah, I remember I had to ask her permission for you to go out with us. You really should quit though. He shrugged and took another drag, slowly exhaling the smoke from his mouth. 
we continued to talk for a while as the sun descended, until darkness began to fall over the forest. As the light faded into night, we loaded our bags and set off down the trail. Keegan pulled the two flashlights that he had brought out from his bag and we used them to light our way. He walked by my side, swishing liquid mouthwash around in his mouth, his solution to hiding the smell of cigarettes from his wife. I laughed heartily when he feebly pulled the bottle of Crest from his bag. Jen probably already knew he was back to smoking. There really is no hiding the smell. The forest canopy exaggerated the evening's darkness, preventing us from seeing much farther than the area illuminated by the flashlights that we held. We walked in a relative silence carefully, moving as to not trip over the undergrowth beneath our feet. As we trudged, I slowly became aware of a strange sound off the trail that seemed to be moving with us, following us. The forest was quiet, devoid of the usual daytime hikers and activity seekers, so the sounds of something keeping pace with us off to the side of the trail discomforted me. At first, I figured it was a squirrel jumping around, foraging the forest floor, or possibly a coyote that had wandered too close to the path. But the weight of the footsteps crushing the crisp leaves pushed that thought from my mind. I turned and I swung my flashlight into the darkness, catching the wisp of black clothing from a figure quickly ducking behind a tree. Hey, I see you there, I shouted. Keegan turned and pointed his light in the same area. What did you see, dude? He questioned. There's someone out there playing games with us. I replied under my breath. The figure hiding behind the tree had not replied or moved out from their cover and a feeling of my knees began to spread from the pit of my stomach. I whispered. Let's get out of here, man. This dude is freaking me out. Turning, I swung my flashlight back towards the trail in the direction that we had been walking, to reveal three tall figures, all wearing worn hooded cloaks obscuring any features. Somehow, they must have crept up on us while we had looked away. I hadn't heard their movements through the forest at all. How could they have moved so quietly? I heard Keegan shout, What the heck? as something or someone came barreling towards us from the direction that we had been coming from. I had felt a sudden powerful impact in the back of my head just above my neck, and my legs limply crumbled below me, and the world went dark as I fell to the hard ground. A pounding headache greeted me as I returned to consciousness. I groaned. My head felt heavy as my thoughts were groggy and slow. I could feel a lump forming on the back of my head where I had been struck. I moved to touch it and I noticed my hands were bound by rope, tied to a small tree behind me. I struggled against the rope, but was unable to break the binds and they painfully dug into my wrists. I could feel panic starting to bubble up but I forced myself to slowly take a breath to try and calm down. I could almost hear my dad's voice from one of his lectures on survival. Focus. Solve a problem and move to the next problem the solution creates. Looking around as I tried to collect myself, I noticed I was alone with no sight of Keegan. I could hear strange chanting that seemed to dance around in the air. I couldn't decipher the language, but it sounded strangely familiar. The sound originated from a circle of tall humanoid figures, 12 from what I could count, about 30 feet away. All wore long black hooded clothing, similar to the four figures that we had been jumped by in the woods. Outside their circle stood four wooden crosses staked into the ground. The crosses were alight with a fire that glowed and flickered, dimly illuminating the surroundings. I strained again on the rope, once more grimacing as it rubbed the skin of my raw wrist. 
My thoughts quickened as the throbbing in my head dulled by the spike of adrenaline that had now shot through my body. Stories Mackenzie had told me about the forest came to the forefront of my mind. Wasn't there something that she had said about a group of cultists and a serial killer who had been found dumping bodies in the Freetown forest? I would wrestle from the dark leaves to my left broke my train of thought. Peering into the dark, my eyes slowly adjusted, and I could make out a crouched humanoid figure. Quiet! I'm gonna try to cut you free. Keegan's voice whispered through the darkness. He carefully stepped out from the brush, and I could feel his hands moving a knife as it began cutting the rope around my hands. What the heck is going on, dude? I grunted quietly under my breath. He whispered into my ear. I had no idea. They took my phone, but I'm glad I always keep a knife in my boots. Now quiet down. Let's get these ropes off and we can get the hell out of here. Keegan grunted in success as the binds holding my hands fell to the forest floor. Rubbing my now raw wrists, I quickly rose to my feet and patted Keegan's shoulder. Thanks. Now let's go, I whispered. I took a step and then froze as the hair on my arms and neck stood up straight. A strange electricity shot through the air. Something was terribly wrong and I could feel it. It took a second, but I noticed what my body had picked up on. The low chanting from the group had subsided, replaced by an eerie quiet that had settled on the area. I turned to look at the group. My mind was screaming to run, but for some reason, I was frozen in place, and it appeared the air had the same effect on Keegan standing next to me. For the first time, I noticed a small object placed in the center of the circle. I strained my eyes and I was able to see what appeared to be an ornate jewel-encrusted bowl, filled with a strangely viscous substance that seemed to be swirling around, although there was no wind. The eerie quiet was dispersed by a loud combustion from the artifact as it was enveloped by a large flame that rose from the center and dripping with the strange liquid. It appeared as if a dark, jagged claw-like hand began to emerge from within the flame. I knew I needed to be silent, but the phenomenon caused me to yelp in shock. At my auditory expulsion, the twelve figures in the circle swiveled their heads in tandem to face our direction. One rose its hooded head. A deep, booming voice came forth. The sacrifices have freed themselves. Abaddon is unable to take physical form for long without their blood. His voice shook the strange hold on my body, and using more force than I felt necessary, I turned to Keegan and I shouted, Run! We leapt to our feet, and blindly set off into the looming pines as fast as we could, away from the cultist congregation. Branches and thorny vines battered into me, ripping my clothing as I dead sprinted through the trees. I could hear the sound of them close behind me, crashing through the forest. I found it strange that although they didn't appear to have any flashlights, they seemed to be tracking us easily through the dark. An odd bass reverberation was erupting from deeper than the forest, bouncing from tree to tree as they continued to chase. I suspected it flowed from the fiery chalice our pursuers left behind. To my left, I could hear Keegan sprinting in time with me as we nimbly maneuvered ourselves over roots and fallen limbs. The forest began to look familiar to me. I knew that all the years that we had spent hiking these trails had allowed us to small advantage as the sounds of pursuit drifted slightly behind us. Vaulting over a fallen log, I finally caught sight of what I had been desperately looking for. A painted trail sign displaying a blue symbol. I was familiar with this marker and I knew that we were close to the parking lot. Yelling Keegan's name to get his attention, we both charged forward in the direction of freedom, 
pushing our aching, oxygen-deprived muscles for one last burst. As we finally reached the clearing of the parking lot, the sight of my beautiful vehicle, still parked where I had left it, emboldened my spirit. Bursting away from the trail, I deftly leapt over the wooden parking barricade and opened the driver door, sliding into the seat. I panicked for a moment as I felt my keys in my pocket and realized that they were missing. And all the commotion I had not noticed. A spare. I had a spare key, but did I ever remove it from my car? Mackenzie was always on me to not leave a key to my prized ride inside. I gladly praised my irresponsibility as I opened the driver's seat visor and my spare key dropped into my lap. Turning the ignition, the engine loudly whined and then erupted into life, the low rumble echoing into the black forest. I threw the transmission into reverse and I backed out, leaning out the passenger window to yell at Keegan to get into my car. Surely, they had taken his keys as well. What I had failed to notice was that Keegan had tripped on a tree root about three feet from the parking lot's edge. My heart caught in my throat as I noticed him standing to his feet, the front of his clothing covered lightly in a dirt from the forest floor. I shouted through the window, my voice shaking. Hurry up, man! Let's go! He took two steps towards the lot and halted, looking down at his chest, a puzzled expression blooming on his face. Suddenly, blood erupted from his chest pouring into a puddle on the ground and seeping into his clothing, staining them crimson red. A dark tendril of something scaly and putrid, almost indescribable, pulled itself from the hole in Keegan's chest, and his body dropped lifelessly to the ground. I don't remember screaming, but I know that I did. I could tell that he was dead before his body even hit the ground and I could see the strange, dark tendril jerk and slide in a crooked, spastic nature as it approached the edge of the parking lot. I slammed the car into drive, tears welling in my eyes, and I shouted with frustration, anger, and sadness. I stomped my foot on the accelerator. The loud squeal of tires accentuated my exit as I drove off into the night. I finally made it back to my house after the short drive down Route 24. I'm not sure what my next step should be. I don't even know if I have a next step to take. I called Mackenzie in hysterics, and she immediately drove over. On the phone, I could tell she couldn't comprehend what I was babbling about, but she knew something was wrong. It's about 4am now as I sit in my living room staring at the blank TV mounted to the wall. An unopened beer in my hand. Who am I kidding? I can't drink anything right now. All I can see is Keegan's lifeless body falling to the ground. The moment is set and repeat to my mind. Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I get out and at least get his body? What's wrong with me? I can almost feel those haunting tendrils at the edge of my mind as I lose myself in my thoughts. The sound of Mackenzie's car pulling into my driveway breaks me from my deep thought, and the jingle of her keys unlocking the front door raises my spirits. She's here now, and she can help me process this. Maybe she'll know what to do. Babe. She calls out as the front door closes. Is everything okay? You sounded so frantic on the phone. I really didn't understand everything you said, but are you okay? You said something's happened to Keegan, but he was waiting for me outside. My mind stopped and my heart skipped a beat. What did she say? Keegan was waiting outside. That's not possible. It can't be. I noticed that I was holding my breath. She turned the corner into my living room, still wearing her sweatpants and loose sweatshirt that I knew she slept in on cool nights. Her soft red hair was tied into a ponytail, aside from a single strand that drifted in front of her freckled face. She leaned on the doorframe, 
her arms crossed, biting her nails. Standing behind her was another figure. It was Keegan. It couldn't possibly be, but it was. The wound in his chest that still sat like a terrible photograph in my mind was nowhere to be found. His eyes, usually soft and inviting, are hard and dark, staring daggers at me as if tendrils are reaching out into the light. Daddy, Daddy, I found two old Megazords in the attic. Can I please play with them? Said my five-year-old son, Jordan. In his left hand, he held a robot figure holding a pair of blasters. The robot was black, had small arms, box-shaped and very wide. His legs were green and vaguely resembled fire trucks. The figure's left foot was a black robotic bull's head, and its right foot was a green robotic rhinoceros's head. In his right hand, he held another robot figure holding a chrome sword and a white shield. This one was mostly yellow at the top half of the body, with golden chrome shoulders. There was a lion's head on the chest, with two cannons on the back of the figure. The head and back was red, and there was a V-shaped crest on the forehead. I lost the instructions and the original packaging of the toys decades ago, but I still remember their names, as well as how they all transformed and combined. They were the live boxer and live robo from a long forgotten TV show from my childhood, Live Man. The components of Live Boxer were two truck animal hybrids, Bison Liner and Rhino Fire. Bison Liner was mostly black while Rhino Fire was green and white. The components for Live Robo was a red bird resembling a fighter jet called Jet Falcon, a lion with two cannons on its back called Land Lion, and two dolphins merged resembling submarines called Aqua Dolphin. Both Live Robo and Live Boxer could combine with each other to form Super Live Robo. In this combination, the torso of a Live Boxer became boots for Live Robo. The truck legs become new armor attachments for the arms. The heads of Bison Liner and Rhino Fire became shoulder pads. And Live Robo gets a new battle helmet. I'm surprised how good the condition of these toys were for their age. Nothing was broken or missing, and they looked as if they were just taken out of the packaging brand new. I got them when I was 8 years old, and I was a big Transformers fan at the time. My grandparents bought me Live Robo and Live Boxer at a small toy shop not too far from where I lived when they visited my family in the spring. I told Jordan to be careful with them because of how old they were. I helped him transform and combine the two robots, and I had a lot of fun sharing a part of my childhood with Jordan. After about an hour of playing, my wife cooked us lunch and I put the two Megazords on the top of my dresser. There is an immensely popular ongoing franchise in Japan called Super Sentai with each season being a soft reboot in its own story. It tells the story of 3 to 12 humans using a device to become a team of multicolored rangers to protect the world from various villains with monsters of the weak plots. The monster would become a giant at the end of each episode, as the rangers fight it with massive vehicles or robotic animals that combined into a super robot. This may have you thinking about Power Rangers, but Power Rangers is the western adaptation of Super Sentai, and heavily relies on used Sentai footage, while blending it in with some original scenes. Power Rangers also first aired in 1993, while Super Sentai had been airing since 1975. It is also worth pointing out that Super Live Robo is the first Megazord combination 
using two Megazords as the components. This is something that would become a staple to both Super Sentai and Power Rangers. And all of these types of combinations, Max Victory Robo, or Lightspeed Solar Zoid from Kuzuku Sentai, or Gogo 5 Power Rangers, Lightspeed Rescue is my personal favorite. The earliest Western adaptation of Super Sentai, however, was in 1988. This was a dubbed parody of Kagaku Sentai Dynaman, simply titled Dynaman. It was very obscure, and there were only six episodes aired on the US cable network. In 1992, there is a second Western adaptation of Super Sentai. There was an English dub of Koju Sentai Live Man that was titled Just as Live Man. The show only aired locally in my area when I lived in Kentucky, and the company that produced this adaptation was called Tazavong Entertainment. This company was short-lived and produced only four children's shows, including Live Man that only aired on a local TV station in the county that I lived in. The company lasted from 1990 to 1992, and went out of business for unknown reasons. Looking back, I remember the show for having a lot of dark and disturbing moments. I remember an episode of a monster tearing through a man's flesh and crushing his bones. The scene was immensely gory for a children's show. The poor man was screaming for help, and when the rangers ran into the scene to save him, the monster killed him by crushing his skull. The man's brain exploded blood and his eye sockets burst out of his head. In another episode, during this segment with the mecha fight, the live robo tossed the monster and it landed right by a small house. As the monster got up, he started to destroy the house. A father and a young girl escaped, but they watched in terror while the mother was trapped inside. The camera cut to the mother screaming as the house was getting destroyed, and debris crushed her in the process. When the monster was defeated, the family went to look for the mother in the rubble and they found her dead. The two of them began mourning for the mother. Either the young girl was super talented, or the director told her that her mother was really dead, and that she will never be able to see her again. But her screams and crying sounded so real, much like the little girl grieving for the loss of her mother in the original 1954 Godzilla film. In another episode, it started with a mecha fight in the city using Live Boxer. As it battled a giant monster, the monster began to ooze a blue fluid all over its body, presumably blood. Live Boxer then grabbed the monster by its feet and then spun it around. While this happened, the fluid splattered on nearby buildings and it slowly killed people who got in contact with it. There was even a puppy that had drowned in this fluid. And then there was a story arc of a psychic child who kept horrific nightmares involving the show's main antagonist, the Armed Brain Army Volt. During catastrophic damage to cities and killings, innocent people that always became true. In these nightmares, there would be scenes of toxic chemicals being sprayed into towns and it would chill people including children, not only die but melt to bones. In other nightmares, monsters would go on a rampage, killing civilians in the most brutal ways possible. There is even a scene where a mother and her child tried to run away and were decapitated by a monster. The live man used this child's nightmares to predict when and how the armed brainy army volts would strike next. After 35 episodes, the show was cancelled, while the Japanese version had about 50 episodes. I remember some kids in my school being very disappointed when the TV show got cancelled, but when Mighty Morphin Power Rangers hit the scene, the show completely disappeared into obscurity. The very few people in school that still remembered Live Man noticed the similarities between the two shows right away, calling Power Rangers a ripoff with a higher budget. 
This was long before the internet became advanced. So they had no idea what Super Sentai is, and how Koju Sentai Live Man, and Karoru Sentai Zoo Ranger, the show the original Power Rangers is loosely based on, were both part of the same franchise. I had no idea what Super Sentai was either until many years later. When I first heard about Live Man getting cancelled, I remember being disappointed. When I was a child, nobody ever told me about the show being linked to the mysterious deaths of a young woman in my town. I was quickly able to move on to other things, and when Mighty Morphin Power Rangers came onto the scene, I was instantly hooked, collecting all the deluxe zords as the years went by. When I was little, I would have the Live Man Megazords either fight or team up with the different Megazords I had in my collection. I still have all the Megazords I collected over the years, and still add Megazords to my collection to this day. However, when Bandai stopped importing the Japanese mold for the Zords and made cheaper watered down versions instead, I boycotted them and only bought the DX Sentai versions. Later in life, I decided to do research on the dubbed version of Live Man, and what I found was really interesting. Juan Savang, the owner of Savang Entertainment, had a contract with Toy, the company behind Super Sentai, and all the other franchises like Carmen Rider and various anime, to release an English dub of Koju Sentai Live Man. Juan also wanted the show to be dark and aimed for teenagers. Many of the 80s Sentai seasons already had a somewhat dark and gritty tone, but Juan wanted it to be more of an edge, hoping to appeal more to Western audiences. In response, Toy gave him access to deleted scenes from the show that were considered too dark and violent for Japanese TV shows, and it allowed his company to incorporate them into the English translation. Savang Entertainment had a very low budget, which is why they would only air the TV show within the county they were located in. About two weeks after the company went out of business, Juan met a man named Haim Saban. Like Juan, Haim was a fan of Super Sentai and wanted to make an adaptation of the show into the US. His company had a much higher production than Savang Entertainment and Juan informed Toy about Haim Saban and his company immediately. Saban was hoping to adapt Kojun Sentai Jetman into Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but due to the dinosaur craze of 1993, thanks to Jurassic Park and Land Before Time, Saban decided to adapt Koyaru Sentai Zoo Ranger instead, and we all know how that turned out. As for Juan, he was the former chief of police in the county that I lived in, and used his experience to get a job with the FBI. In 1996, he was in a very high ranking with the FBI, and founded a mysterious agency called Black Mercury. All that is known about Black Mercury is that they investigate and sometimes cover up anomalies from around the world, and even outer space that are potentially life-threatening. They occasionally work with, and in some ways are similar, with the SCP Foundation. However, unlike the SCP Foundation, Black Mercury focuses much more on studying the anomaly, and sometimes it would contain the anomaly temporarily for further research and experiments. After that, they either release the anomaly or send it to the SCP Foundation. Black Mercury hopes to use the anomalies as weapons or even torturing devices for the US government. Those people most likely know about the alleged Viper Man in the New York subway tunnels and what happened to the first search team that went missing. Somebody once uploaded information about it on a Reddit simply titled, The Viper Man. I have an online friend on Steam that likes to collect action figures and claimed to have bought an unreleased toy on eBay from the Ultimasaurus, which was meant to be the mascot of a cancelled toy line from 1998 called Jurassic Park Chaos Effect. He supposedly noticed strange things happening with the figure, 
and posted it on Reddit and claimed that agents of Black Mercury knocked on his door a few days later, confiscating the item due to its potential danger. For those who are interested in reading, the thread is called, I bought an unreleased toy on eBay. A few days after my son had discovered those old toys in the attic, I asked my wife to pick up the morning paper by the driveway. When she handed it to me, the headline gave me an uneasy feeling. Mysterious blue fluid kills four people.